Welcome back to Night School, episode 003, The Raven, part three, and this will be our final episode. And back with me is my colleague, Mr. Wesley Chance. Welcome back. Hey, good to be back. All right, and I guess I'll just share this screen really quickly for our YouTube watchers. Um, just doing that. Um, teacher moment here, making it. There we go. And shared. Okay, great. Um, can you see that now, Wes? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so since we got through six stanzas last time, we were doing a, a, a fairly uh, close, close reading, it seems like, yesterday. Um, we have 12 stanzas left to us today, and this will be our final day. So we're going to go two stanzas at a time and um, try and be a little more conscientious of time. And so that's part of the game. Uh, also, this time around, we wanted to um, mention a couple things about poetry itself and how to read poetry and things you can look for with poetry. And so, um, Wes, I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about the structure of the stanzas and the rhyme schemes and how to recognize a rhyme scheme. And um, I, I don't know what that might mean, too. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, well, it's a kind of, um, it's a kind of identifying game, right? It's like figuring out what kind of a thing you have uh, appearing before you, which is sort of what this poem's about, right? And this is a very odd form. Um, to my knowledge, it's one that Poe invented. Uh, it's got some curious things going on in it, as we, we talked about, not just the diction, but the form itself, which has um, some internal rhyme, where within these long, I think they're octosyllabic, uh, or not octosyllabic, but um, they're octome octometer. I'm not even sure how to say that, that one. It's it's like there's um, there's eight trochees, which are the opposite of iams. Right, so you have a hard stress and then a light stress. Open here, I flung the shutter, and so you do that eight times in a row, and I'm in the middle of each line, and at the end of each line you have a rhyming word. Uh, and that same rhyming word will appear again uh, later on in the stanza. Um, uh, right. And so would you represent, you would represent this form as A, B, C, B, 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 right? Yeah, you can, you can letter it out like that um, to kind of give yourself a shorthand to watch for adjustments in the pattern as well. And I... I haven't been looking that closely at it. There could well be some variation, but I think that he pretty much sticks, yeah, just to that same that same scheme once he has it uh, established. Um, and having done that, it's like he sets up the uh, the requirements for the game that he's playing with the poem, uh, and he he sort of stays within the limits. Um, that the poem itself sets. And if you ever try that, you'll find that it leads to some interesting creative solutions to problems that you've set yourself. And, and you come up with stuff that you otherwise would never have, uh, have been likely to, to discover. Um, so anyway, that, uh, that's probably a, a pretty loose and uh, not, not super um, rigorous, uh, treatment of just the, the form, the rhyme scheme. Um, but I think, you know, for, for the practical purposes of of enjoying the poem, that's about what you'd want to want to know, I hope. You know, and I think it does connect to the wider theme we've been tracing out in the last couple lectures on this poem that um, there's a sort of repetition or mimicry or self-mimicry or, or um, imitation or echo, a dissipated paler imitation is it and we we mentioned that that might be a comment on what poetry is to nature or life or what this poetic form or movement is to another poetic form or what poetry is supposed to be and you see that even in the structure of the rhyme a b c so promising and then b regression b imitation b in a half line not even not even enough to muster a full line by that uh, mm -hmm. That final line is almost that is that is our narrator and what he has become from all that he could have been. 
Um, and so, should we get into this, uh, Wes? I like I. I think I think we're getting right where we're, <laughs> the excitement was at its climax, at its pitch last time, and then I said, "Well, time to go." Sorry. And uh, okay. isn't that like a class? And truly, this has become night school with us doing this every day this week. And I've, I've really enjoyed doing this. And I hope the listeners uh, enjoy doing this sort of thing, too. We're like Simpsons characters conducting night school for self-betterment uh, people or just for any teachers or for any, you know, parents attempting to be teachers as well. You know, use this stuff. We do it for you. All right, Wes, do you want to take these first two open here? Sure, we'll, we'll go two at a time, I guess. Okay. All right, so yeah. open, open here, I flung the shutter, when with many a flirt and flutter in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not a minute stopped or stayed he, but with mien of lord or lady, perched above my chamber door, perched upon a bust of palace just above my chamber door, perched and sat and nothing more. Then this ebony bird, beguiling my sad fancy into smiling, by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore. Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly grim and ancient raven wandering from the nightly shore. Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's Plutonian shore, quoth the raven, nevermore. All right, so the excellent reading of the and, um, and it really does help for the interpretive process when, it, when the poem is read well. And I, I would, I would recommend that teachers model reading of poetry to their students before requiring that their students attempt poetry themselves. It can, that can often lead to very poor execution as if you were handing someone an instrument and just asking them to play it without practice. And that a poem really does resonate when spoken well. And so uh, here, and here are a couple of my thoughts. This, this raven comes in and it's described as sort of like a Roman general stately it's from saintly days of yore so like this heavenly golden age time um he has the mean of a lord or lady that means the way or excuse me the i think it, it means the uh sort of uh way of being of lord or lady um but that would bear looking up vocabulary word there um it gets on a bust of pallas pallas athena of course and she's named pallas athena because she supposedly had a a friend named pallas who, who was killed and then she, or, or was an enemy that she slain and then um, skinned and, uh, and formed the Palladium from the skin of that creature. One of the older myths about Pallas Athena. So, so and she, she is known, at least in Ovid's Metamorphoses for being a rather cruel god, goddess, even though she, she's a goddess of wisdom, but wisdom has a dark and, a, and like a kind aspect. And um, people can get caught up in it. In fact, Arachne does and ends up paying a big price for messing with Pallas Athena. So there, there are dark undertones even to Pallas. It's not, it is not appropriate simply to say that she is the goddess of wisdom and this raven is simply a symbol of wisdom because it is an image of Odin, the wisest of the, the Norse gods. Um, there's also a darkness to it. A raven brings... Um, odes of death and we know this from harry potter which we're reading right now and the the notion of say see a, a raven to um the art of divination and what that can possibly mean <laughs> but also palace athena she brings death just as often as she brings life i mean she certainly brings death to the trojans by way of odysseus and um so this is a there is a it's like a stately uh statement of execution is about to come if you read the undertones as well as the overtones the stateliness mm -hmm. mixed with the darkness that is mounting and so we also have these words uh, decorum countenance and um let's see uh, lordly all these words sort of connoting a victorian like british lord um, and, but then again, we get the darkness now a little more heavy handed in night's Plutonian shore, night, dark, chaotic, primordial God in the Greek religion, Pluto, the Roman name of the Greek God, Hades, dark, uh, death or, or the God of death and the shore, the shore, the entrance to it, at least in this case. And so somebody has recently been taken, 
um, or this raven has come to announce that something has happened that it cannot be, they cannot unhappen. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, it's getting pretty clear what, what, <laughs> what the raven and what nature is trying to say to the, the narrator. And, you know, move on. She's dead. Yeah. Well, it's it's odd that he um, is first beguiled into smiling, yes. right? Uh, by by the raven's very uh, sternness or or you know um, bearing uh, of 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 seriousness, and so it's a it's an odd sort of um, disconnect between the narrator, the speaker's initial impression of the raven and then um when he when he poses the question right what is your name and then he gets this very unexpected response nevermore right that makes me wonder to what extent poe is embodying the romantic tendency to be ironic and to take a situation as humorous that was potentially very much serious and to try and uh sort of belittle it or diminish the importance of it but sort of utterly failing to do so, right? He's only lying to himself, and even he doesn't believe who he is, what he's saying, or what he's doing. Um, hmm. Well, shall we move on? <laughs> Go for it. Much I marveled this ungainly foul to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore, for we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door, bird or beast upon the sculptured bust above his chamber door, with such name as nevermore. But the raven, sitting lonely on the placid bust, spoke only that one word as if the as if his soul in that one word he did outpour, nothing farther than he uttered, not a feather than he fluttered, till I scarcely more than uttered, other friends have flown before. On the morrow, he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, nevermore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so we're starting to hear some some definite themes. Uh, the the repetition of the, um, the insistence on the speaker's part that this, doesn't really mean anything, right? That can't, that can't matter, you know? There's no such, uh, there's no precedent for such a thing, and oh, I'm weird. gonna be, I'll be darned if this is a, a thing that's actually happening right now, you know? Um, which is, you know, funny to us as the readers, but um, but then, you know, he, he gets kind of serious in the next stanza, though, because um, he's muttering to himself, now about other friends and clearly yeah lenore has got to be the top of that list right um that have that have flown before and uh and so he's not going to get to attach this rave because sure enough he'll be gone soon and now that's that's when the the what was the name nevermore now becomes an answer to that um that complaint, I guess, that muttering, right? Now it's nevermore. The raven was, is going to stick around. And what do you think of that word nevermore, Wes? It's, it's as strong a negative as you could conceive, I think, right? It's, it's the, um, the inversion of eternity or something like that. Yes, that's right. That's right. The eternity that stretches behind actuality as eternal past, graveyard. The unconscious, Hades, yeah. Plutonian shore, or rather that which lies beyond the Plutonian shore, the great sea, Pluto's. Um, and so, yeah, and other friends have flown before. I mean, clear imagery, you either, you know, you either fly down to hell or up to heaven, and thus, you know, dead, uh, and on the morrow he will leave me as my hopes. Again, I like that, and in my addition here, from Poetry Foundation, hopes is capitalized. Is it the same yeah. as yours? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, hope we know from Dante is one of the theological virtues: hope, faith, and love or charity. Caritas is the word, so it can be easily translated as both. Care and charity both come from it. Um, but hope is tied to going towards heaven, and then Dante, abandon all hope, ye who enter in hell. 
And then when you get to the end of the Inferno at 34, you, you see the stars again and you see stars are the last words and each of the, each of the canticles mm -hmm. for suggesting potentially a parallelism between all three that perhaps hell and heaven are not so much physical places lodged in time, but psychological places that eternally recur within humans who are phylogenetically similar, who are isomorphic, the same, and so experience things in the same way. And so it's like he's saying that his hope for heaven or that which caused heaven for him, his kingdom of heaven or his Eden has disappeared. And I think that's actually literally true in this case in that this, this raven is playing sort of like a snake-like Luciferian role and that it is definitely disturbing his, id his idyllic peace. Yeah, he's... I, he's not, I don't know if he's in idyllic peace exactly, but he's in a kind of, um, he's in a kind of safe and secure, uh, circumscribed kind of mourning, right? Right. And, and into which the raven enters, yeah, I guess presumably to, to shuffle things up a little bit. Um, and it seems like at this point, that is being aligned with yeah he's a saintly bird uh, sorry a raven of the saintly days of yore he's um aligned with with hopes with a capital h um so a, a very yeah a very ambiguous image here yeah all well, right so uh, startled at the stillness broken by reply so aptly spoken doubtless said i what it utters is its only stock in store, caught from some unhappy master whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster till his songs one burden bore, till the dirges of his hope that melancholy board, burden bore of never, never more. But the raven still beguiling all my fancy into smiling, straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door, then upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking fancy unto fancy, thinking what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking nevermore. All right. Yeah. So what it utters is its only stock in store. So, yeah, we have this interesting first stanza contrasted with the second stanza here, and that we have this, this, claim of sort of a poet similar to perhaps Poe himself who who it's it's a disaster that he's been so successful that his songs have followed faster and faster and that it's his talent has become a burden to him and this is sort of and then dirges of his hope again a dirge that's uh that's an interesting contrast because a dirge is a song of sorrow and so a song of sorrow of his hope a melancholy burden bore I don't know, I may be off. And we, we have this even stronger of never, never more there. We have never, continuous with never more. And um, I mean, that's just very strong. Um, the way so, I'm taking no. that, the way I'm taking that stanza is to be him saying that he's gonna, again, try to find a reason to ignore what the bird is saying. And now his reason is that it's only repeating what it heard from some unhappy master. Ah, so yes. some other, yeah, some other person, not unlike the speaker, uh, was the master of this bird before, right? It was his pet bird. Oh, and wow. Yeah, no, that, and that goes much better with our theme, too, because then again, that, that is how the scholar would perceive even the master or the real piece of information in front of him, right? That if since his source of knowledge was some other master, somebody else's source of knowledge must also be some other master, that none of them could be productive of new knowledge, of new information. Um, and that that's precisely what's being disproved just by the presence of the raven at this very moment in time, as you were pointing out. Mm -hmm. And so, well, um, but the raven still beguiling all my fancy and smiling straight. I wheeled a cushion seat in front of bird and busting door. Then upon a velvet singing, I but took myself to linking fancy unto fancy, 
thinking what this ominous bird of yore, I'm sorry, I'm just repeating this. I just have to look through it again like this. What this grim, ungainly, ghastly gaunt, that's such a powerful line, an ominous bird of yore meant him roving nevermore. It's as if he falls into a, a, a reverie, in the, or but not a reverie like he was first in, but rather it's almost as if he's actually attempting to think. Um, <laughs> it's looking um, that way, yeah. He's letting fancy unto fancy, but also thinking what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, gas, ghastly gaunt and ominous bird of yore meant. So, so he's not only you know, letting his stream of consciousness go, linking I, imaginative image and imaginative image and constructing a narrative in his mind, but also questioning it and putting words to it. It's like he's, he's finally recognizing the existence of this bird and trying to understand it. Yeah, and there's, I mean, there's something interesting going on because in a way, you know, the very language is borrowed from a previous stanza, the rhyme, beguiling and smiling. He's used those exact words before, but as you say, it seems like there's a shift here that's coming about where he's really turning his attention uh, fully to um, to meditate on the bird. And yeah, he's he's still very much in his own head and his own fancies, you know, that that word that I think has pretty much been replaced in modern language by fantasy, um, but it's the same kind of thing, right? And and so he's still he's still not quite actually looking at the raven so much as his ideas of the raven, um, but he's getting there. He's 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 wondering, yeah. Right, and yeah, you can see that. In his language in that fifth line of six in the second stanza with this grim, ungainly, ghastly gone. He's, he's, he's showing off again. He's using mm. that sort of fanciful or, um, uh, what, what was the word from earlier? I think it was a P word. Um, sort of, um, I have to check it really quickly. It was called in the very first stanza, ponder, bleak, uh, quaint. It's quaint mm. language, yes. <laughs> and so, so uh, again, he's trying to house this experience within uh, his former experiences or his, his current sort of quaint method of, of speaking about things. Uh, I mean, I, it's interesting to what extent that a quaint method of speaking belies an underlying ideology about what the world should be like, and thus what the world is, right? Yeah. That, that he can describe this situation without even understanding it is, is I think, belies uh, his, his unconscious wish not to get to the bottom of this situation, but to ignore it to the, as much as possible in order to maintain his current set of beliefs about reality and his current actions and behaviors within that reality because of course that would mean he would have to do as little as possible which would be the best possible solution because you don't have to do anything <laughs> right right yeah it's always best if a problem turns out not to be a problem right exactly so if this raven would just go away this gremlin gainly ghastly gone and ominous bird of yore um shall i for the next two yeah these are great these line this is where it gets really good yeah I'll give my best. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining with my head at ease reclining on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er. But whose velvet violet light Lining with the lamplight gloating o'er, she shall press on nevermore. Then methought the air grew denser, perfumed with an unseen censer, swung by seraphim, whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God hath lent thee by these angels. He hath sent thee respite, respite, and nepenthe from thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, oh, quaff, this kind of nepenthe, and forget this lost Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Yeah. Yeah, so that that's that's different, right? <laughs> the uh, the the thought uh, about the you know trying to figure out what the raven meant and croaking nevermore now shifts to um, a game where uh, it looks like seeing the pillows reminds the speaker that she shall press those pillows nevermore, right? So that's apparently where he, his line of thinking draws him back to once and more. 
once again. Um, and then he gets this kind of vision, right, of um, a very strong uh, religious, biblical, apocalyptic kind of vision with the, the seraphim, the, the very high and um, scary angels, you know, uh, who are waving censers, so they're, they're, they're perfuming the air. Um, you get this great uh, auditory image of the footfalls tinkling on the tufted floor. Um, and he, and he breaks the silence, right? He cries out. Um, and I'm not quite sure which one of them is the wretch. I, I think he's talking to himself. Um, he's calling himself wretch. Thy God hath lent thee, um, respite, respite and nepenthe from thy memories of Lenore, quaff, right? So meaning like drink down, drink it to the dregs. Um, and forget the lost Lenore. He, he's, I think, telling himself this, right? He's like, why am I still thinking about her when I've got this great, you know, weird thing happening that I can think about? And the weird thing that he's supposed to be trying to think about tells him that he will never get that respite, right? It's, it's really quite, uh, quite rough. <laughs> well, uh, Nepenthe, though. Tell us about Nepenthe. Well, I, I, you, you would think I, I might be able to, but I, I, I can't. I you don't know. remember that? Okay, so it's the, uh, that's what Helen talks about giving them or does give them, I think. I can't remember which. Oh, is that when the Telemachus. That? So in the translation that I teach, it's called Heartsies. And so, yeah. Yeah, no, that does make sense. Yeah. yeah. And, and they think, yeah, they think that's another it's, Greek thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, so. That, that works very nicely because what, what I think I see happening is this anomalous piece of information presents itself and it presents itself in several, several different languages, which this romantic poet or this modern man of Poe's time can't understand. He can't understand the language of nature, the wind. He can't understand uh, a symbolic image like a raven and what that could mean um, from like Norse mythology or even, even, uh, even biblical, right? The raven is the the creature that doesn't come back to Noah after the flood. Um, uh, I believe it's the raven. Um, and uh, then, um, but, and, and, and also it's sort of stately. And so there's this idea of like Romanesque virtue there. And like, there, there are all these underlying ideas if, if you have the appropriate sort of education to see them and the pro appropriate guide to find them. But apparently this person this person doesn't have one, but no, actually, there is still a very powerful one in the air. That that would be the Christian imagery. That's what captures his imagination. It's the seraphim, the highest choir of angels. So says Dionysus, the Areopagitan. Uh, of course, Dante agrees with that um, as well. They're the six-winged angels who cover their heads, their feet, and their sort of midsection genitalia, of course. And um, so suggesting that, you know, they are, they are something unseen. They are, and, and they're associated, I, I believe, I, with the, the virtue love or charity. But I, I could be wrong on that. Um, but it's just interesting that, that it is finally, so this raven has been an image of the messenger, as in it's bringing the message that Lenore is gone from this, this shore, this liminal state, this, this in between, this limbo. And now angel, which literally comes from the Greek angelos, which means messenger. Um, now these angels pop in, who bring messages, pop into this man's head. And they say, and using this Greek term, you know, nepenthe from thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, oh quaff, this time nepenthe and forget this lost Lenore. Finally, he's getting the message because mm -hmm. the message is being spoken in a language that he understands, that has emotional impact or importance for him something that's living for him it's almost as if i don't and i don't know whether this is true or not poe is claiming that there is sort of a a still resonating language of divinity that can be spoken that can convey eternal truths at his time if people would just use it um which that seems, he's clearly doing here that that seems to be the 
the play, right, where the, the raven has has surmounted the bust of Pallas. So it's it's placed itself, you know, above oh. the Greek. You know, it's like, uh, you know, taken in, and it's using that Greek word there, um, but it's taken that in and, and sort of uh, transcended it, melded it with the uh, this Christian imagery. I, but again, it's, now that it's um, now that it's sort of fixed on this quote, the raven nevermore, final half line, everything that the, the speaker says up to that point is going to get negated by the by the final half line of each stanza. So the more that he, you know, berates himself about what he should be figuring out, the more the raven is going to negate that. Um, so he's he's in a bind. <laughs> Uh, all right, should I go on? Yes, and all right. All right. What we have here, we have a few more here. Okay, we're at thirty minutes now, so I guess ten minutes left. Cool. Yeah, we're in. We're in sight. Prophet said, "I thing of evil. Prophet still, if bird or devil, whether tempter sent or whether tempest tossed thee here ashore, desolate yet all undaunted on this desert land enchanted." On this home by horror haunted, tell me truly, I implore, is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, by that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore, tell this soul with sorrow, with him the distant Eden, it shall clasp a sainted maiden whom the angels name Lenore. Clasp a rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, quoth the raven, nevermore. All right. Well, uh, very interesting that we, we, ha we have two stanzas here that are just explicitly Christian. Whether tempter sent the tempter of the devil, of course, or whether tempest tossed the uh, here ashore, uh, uh, that echoes the tempest by William Shakespeare. And so multiple traditions coming together here, right? The sort of English dramatic tradition in the language of English with, with the imagery of Christianity and the tempter, the devil, as, we've, as our language has molded it in our imagination. Desolate, yet all undaunted on this desert land enchanted. Again, there's that sort of image of the exodus there, of the exile, um, Old Testament imagery, or Jesus out in the desert. That's sort of, again, hellish, um, but in the sort of uh, absentia aspect, the deepest sort of hell, the hell of isolation. And on this home by horror haunted, horror now uh, capitalized in the same way hope was. Mm -hmm. Tell me truly, I implore, is there any bomb in Gilead? A Gilead I know is a Christian reference or a biblical reference too, but I'm not sure what it is. Do you know, Wes? I don't know where it's a, where it appears exactly, but it's. I'm pretty sure that is a direct quote. And I think it's a question. Um, here, well, I'm forgetting if it's a statement uh, when it appears in the Bible that there is Bam and Gilead. So either he's um, doing a kind of, uh, uh, you know, direct quote of a question straight from the Bible, or he's taking what was a positive statement and, and doubting it. Um, either way, you know, using the Bible against itself in some sense. Um, yeah, and I, I think even the structure of this agrees with that because you have the same first line repeated, and I love how you read it. Prophet, said I, thing of evil. <laughs> and uh, prophet still of bird or devil. And so we have that symbolic understanding that's suggested there. But then in the second line, we have the devil mentioned and in the first stanza, but in the second stanza, we have heaven mentioned. Mm. So there's that tension of opposites there with this Christian imagery that's, that just begs to be brought into existence, which is even by the structure of the poem. And so we have God at the end of this second line with, with continuity marks on both sides of him, indicating his infinity, his infinitude, where we have this tempter with this weak weather word, this like if level word, uh, separated off from everything by a comma. And in fact, the second part of the line is far stronger than tempter, though it may mo modify the tempter. Tempest tossed thee here ashore. Um, mm -hmm. Also echoing sort of the lustful and the punishment of them in Dante. 
the uh, being buffeted by winds, as if they are in a tempest tossed, made of their own passions from life that toss them about, like the winds tossed about Aeneas's ships in Book One of the Aeneid. Uh, after Juno gets uh, Aeolus lustfully to agree to to take a nymph to release his winds, though it is Neptune, or the force of order in nature that is supposed to command him, not simple lust, but Juno gets to us all at some time or another. <laughs> oh. <laughs> all right, and so we also have this sort of um, Mary imagery here too, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a sainted maiden, a radiant maiden, whom the angels name Lenore. I mean, she would also be al almost be like Persephone um, pre-Hades um, as a radiant maiden, except for it's angels that name her Lenore. Um, but again, that's sort of, it does strike me as very strong imagery of her being in a heaven-like place and thus dead. Yeah, it's, it's tough because it's unclear whether the raven is saying that she is not in heaven, right? Mm -hmm. Or if the raven is saying that it doesn't adore God or that heaven doesn't bend above them both. Um, whether the raven is saying, yeah, all that is true, but you're not going to make it there, right? It's all, it's all sort of because of so many questions and, and requests being piled one on top of the other, uh, even if we assume that the raven does mean something, which the speaker definitely seems to assume, right? Uh, we, we have no means, this is a poorly constructed experiment. We have, we have no means of figuring out what the raven is actually answering, which part of this. Yeah, uh, I think, yeah that's part of the totally problem. Rejecting it. Yeah, sorry, I think that's part of the problem of the raven's method, or the, the scholar's method here, mm -hmm. right? He's, he's making all these confabulations He's imagining the situation. He's letting his imagination sort of run rampant rather than questioning the raven or, or trying to interrogate the situation, to investigate it, um, truly, to make inquiry. Um, he, he should be, you know, asking questions. But instead, he's, he's making up fancy images. And I, I know I, I said that the anomaly is probably bridging the gap of language by using images to populate his mind that he would understand from stories that would have circulated around him during the course of his life. Um, but also, also it could be the case that he's, he's running as fast as he can from the anomaly by means of this sort of confabulation, that he's trying to give the appearance of figuring out what's happening but with this overinflated language, uh, this pompous, quaint language, he, he's actually getting far, farther and farther from the truth. Um, I wonder to what extent he himself, like the Dante's devil, is keeping himself from the distant Eden. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what to make of that spelling difference there. Yeah. I haven't... I haven't many things nothing's come to mind for me uh, seeing that anywhere else spelled that way but i think it's fair to guess that that's a and you know paradise kind of thing that's what i was wondering and i just because of the sound of it made that connection it could be wrong but uh mm -hmm. it does it does look like it is right there if you and we have, yeah we gotta we gotta get it to rhyme with maiden so <laughs> it's that's important true. that's true <laughs> <laughs> that's a good point um okay Okay. Oh, wow. There we go. There we go. Is it, are we at our last two here? Mm-hmm. All right. Be that word our sign of parting. Bird or fiend, I shrieked of starting. Get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul hath spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart and take thy form from off my door. Quoth the raven, Evermore. And the raven never flitten, still is sitting, still is sitting on the pallid bust of Pallas just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming. And the lamplight over him streaming throws his shadow on the floor. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted. Evermore. <laughs> That's fun. It's, yeah, so it really, um, 
really rolls to its conclusion there, where we get we get the last of the Raven's speech, which is the only thing he's ever said, nevermore. Uh, and, and then um, the narrator, the speaker, ceases to even, yeah, attempt to interrogate or to pontificate at or whatever it is he's been doing. Um, he, he seems to give up, right? He, uh, he's stuck in that last stanza. And it's, it's, I guess, his, I guess it's his own fault because, yeah, he's taken uh, the Raven's message to be one of, um, of desolation, of hopelessness. Uh, he, he seems to conclude that the bird is, um, you know, either just an accident, right, bird, or fiend, right, or evil. And so either way, heaven and all of the saintly stuff is thrown out the window at this point. Um, we're back to Knight's Plutonian shore. Um, we're back to the, bas the, the pallid bust of Pallas. Um, and, and we don't hear anything else about the angels and Lenore. Um, it's a, it's a pretty, it's a drag. <laughs> it's rough. Yeah. And even the, uh, the image of light becomes entirely secularized. Lamplight over him. Streaming throws his shadow on the floor. It's not even pagan imagery. It's a lamplight. It's an electric light. It's, mm -hmm. it's sort of a pathetic, it's not like the sun casting the shadow of a mountain across a meadow it's a it's a dinky lamp it casts a tiny little shadow on your on your pathetic little desk um but even still it is an image of coming to consciousness and of things working as they are meant to be the lamp reveals the shadow for what it is the lamp creates the conditions for the shadow and the living thing is that which throws the shadow on the floor as the shades in purgatory are so quick to notice about Dante. That's, that, I, that strikes me as the moment of recognition. Hmm. When he understands what has actually happened and he accepts that the tempest or the emotional dysregulation is going to come into him about the message from Knight's Plutonian shore, the messenger saying that Lenore or his ideal or his woman had, so either his, his future either in terms of his poetic aspirations or his future in terms of his future with a woman and a family person um, are now on, on Pluto's terms. Their, Charon is taking them across mm -hmm. the sea to Pluto and uh, they're gone, goodbye. And even, even under such daft conditions as his lamp light in his study, this great revelatory truth can occur to him finally. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but and he, and he sort of deals with it in a typically romantic resentful and childish way right not heroically again again he has the opportunity to accept it and then be like well those are the facts of life or you know time to move on and produce something great about it or devote devote myself to something important after losing someone like that but he says and my soul He's like a Sorrows of Young Werther character here. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. It's, it's like something a teenager would say after not being allowed to go to a dance. Um, <laughs> it's, it's pretty final, yeah. Um, now, I, I, guess I, I guess I agree with the, the read that He's realized something at the end of the poem here. Um, what the quality of his realization uh, does seem to be a, a distinctly unpromising one, right? That he will never overcome this uh, this particular negative truth, right? Um, he'll never move on. He'll never, uh, yeah, lift himself up, lift his soul up from the shadow that that imagery of the shadow at the end as you were saying that about the lamplight made me think of the the cave in in the republic too right it's like in what sense is his hopelessness um grounded on uh, on a on a, a verity like like a truth that is 
is real, that is uh, substantial, and, and, and in what sense is it grounded on a, a kind of interposition of some illusion that, yeah, is not partaking of, uh, of, a, of a life giving, a, a sun like truth, you know, as you say, it's a lamp light, it's a, it's a man made sort of thing. I, um, yeah, I agree uh, com completely because Dante, what he says about the shades in hell is that they've been, they're denied the good of the intellect. And what the good of the intellect is, is the capacity to adapt to anomalous information in a situation in time. You make changes in the present, not in the future. And so those who are dead cannot use the intellect because they can no longer make changes because you can't make changes after you're dead. And so you can't. And, and, and so the whole point, and so that connects to the idea of hopelessness in hell because these characters don't have hope because they can't make any changes in the present. So everything will remain the same forever. And so a person mm -hmm. who refuses to use his intellect to make changes in the present in accordance with what the present situation actually is will become stultified or, or yet will sort of because of pride or arrogance or thinking themselves more than human. And what a human is, is the creature that adapts best. That's why we live in every environment and can even exist outside the world. Um, no other creature has ever done that. Um, but uh, what you do is deny your capacity to change, like the Luciferian yeah. figure at the bottom of the Inferno, encased in ice that he produces through his own tears, the blood of the sinners he's chewing on and now swallowing, and, and the beating of his own impotent wings. And so you see here that he indicates his impotence and his inability or his unwillingness to think in a sort of Miltonian Luciferian way, his unwillingness to serve or to use his mind to serve the truth which is mm -hmm. shall be lifted nevermore. He says that now. And now he's quoting the raven who he claimed or desired to believe was itself quoting the master. So now he's not even just secondary, he's tertiary. Right. He any of his own thinking. He's, he's less than a shadow. He has finally become the third half, B, you know, the fourth half B line in the stanza, the A, B, C, B, 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 that final B. That final beta, um, that derivative, completely derivative. He's accepted it. He'll never be anything. He's hopeless now because he won't use his mind. That's, yeah. Huh. Very bleak indeed. Yeah. Well, a uh, a rousing first edition of Night School. Um, I hope that that is useful and interesting to to someone out there um would love to hear people's comments uh, critiques are welcome yeah absolutely and um uh i we were thinking and this may change that we might move on to walt whitman's song of myself this initial theme of night school or this initial course we were th we we're planning to focus on american poetry and you know, maybe at some point we could expand that into American literature and maybe do some, some staples like Huck Finn, Moby Dick, and um, The Great Gatsby, um, just to, to again, uh, make accessible some analysis and some educational materials that people might encounter during the course of their education and that a lot, I think, of young teachers teach and could use some, you know, could use some materials for, and that some older teachers might be curious to see what you know, some mid-stage career teachers have to say about these, these uh, poems. And, you know, I, it hones everybody for masters to engage with each other. Totally, yeah. I, I think the last thing I would say about this poem is that um, as far as a, an assignment for students, it's going to be a really tough one, uh, especially if they haven't done a lot with poetry. Um, but it it is really really cool as a kind of one off uh lesson and it especially works nicely if you're reading um any of Poe's other stuff right because he has such a distinct style and and he's such a uh a fascinating personality that that comes through in everything that he writes um so it's it's short enough it can be paired with any of his stories which are some of which are pretty short um 
and uh, yeah, like actually go try doing it. See, see how it goes. Love to hear back from people. Yeah. 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 And we are open to feedback. We do this, um, you know, we do this, uh, we do this a lot. We do this professionally. This is our, this is our thing. And so, um, you know, we're always seeking to improve and uh, feedback is very helpful. So um, I hope this has been helpful. We hope this has been helpful. We're going to keep putting this sort of thing out. Look, out for the next poem coming out soon and you won't be without night school for very long. All right. Thank you. Thanks.